Hey there, Grace and peace to you all. It's Captain Roger from the Grass Valley Corps of the Salvation Army. Thank you for joining us with our uh, worship online time today. Uh, this is our worship and study time. Grab your Bibles because you're going to want to follow along. Even though I read scripture to you, don't trust me. Don't trust anyone. You got to, well, maybe trust is not the right word. Trust, but verify. Verify. Anytime someone tells you something is from the Bible and you should check it out for yourself, you should check it out for yourself, right? Make sure that the things that we as pastors, as teachers, as just people, especially people on the internet, anything we tell you, you really need to make sure that it is what it says, right? Um, like I said, grace and peace to you. We're in Acts 21 today. And if you remember back to our last session together, Paul had returned to Jerusalem, even though he had been told numerous times by various spirit-filled followers of the way that doing so would work out badly for him. There in Jerusalem, he found that the gift he brought wasn't enough to balance out the unrest stirred up by his presence. He uh, had agreed to try to rehabilitate his reputation among the more conservative followers and the Jewish unbelievers. And so he was going to complete this week-long purity ritual and publicly support four of his brothers in Christ who were undergoing a traditional Jewish Nazarite vow. And they would uh, uh, participate in purity rituals together. And then Paul was going to pay for these expensive sacrifices for these four guys so that people could see he was still an observant Jew and that he wasn't trying to talk his people out of following their customs, even though he was teaching that non-Jews didn't need to follow those customs for God to embrace them. We uh, ended with Acts 21:26, where Luke, the author of this fine history of the early church, shared this. He said, the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Now, these kind of vows, they were very public events and they were carefully tracked to make sure that those participating were doing so faithfully. That included a scheduled conclusion which was good for those urging Paul to make a public statement of piety. Some people also think it made it possible for his opponents to plan to move against him, though there's no solid evidence that what happened next wasn't just one of those things. No solid evidence, but you know, I may have some suspicions here. Look at verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he's brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. And then Luke has uh, a little parenthetical notice here in verse 29. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So what's going on here? Well, on the seventh day of his purity ritual, Paul would have gone to the temple to receive this specially dedicated water of atonement, which was necessary for him to complete the ceremony. And this in turn, that completing the ceremony, that was essential for him before he could participate in the, the, the final sacrifices of his four friends. So before he could pay for that, he had to be pure. Otherwise, the, the actions he took towards them or with them would make them unclean and they'd pretty much need to start this process over. So he's trying to follow the rules because Paul was very good at following the rules. Now, while he was there, some folks from Ephesus who happened to be there, you see, this is where I start to get suspicious. So they just happened to be there while Paul came in for this part of his thing. And they began to work the crowd up around him into a frenzy, right? And they do this by leveling two very serious, very emotional charges against him. They say, oh, Paul, he's desecrating our faith because he teaches against our people, our law, and this temple. And then they say that he's profaned the temple by bringing a Greek inside with him. Now, these are both really grave charges. Like I said, they would have stirred strong emotions in those who hear them. Someone 
in Jerusalem had been spreading these kind of rumors against Paul's teaching. Just like in Ephesus, there had been people stirring these kind of rumors against Paul's teaching. And so these stories that are swirling around and the knowledge that Paul had been spending a lot of time out among foreign people, these are the kind of things that played into the fearful, paranoid tendencies that had grown up with the surge of nationalism that had swept through Israel's politics in recent years. Now, we got to ask, just like I said, you got to check things when people tell you that they're in the Bible. You know what? We should check these accusations out before we just say, oh man, that Paul, that, that these people, we're going to trust them. They're in the temple. They're saying these things and obviously it must be true. It, what we should do is see if these accusations stand up to rational thought. Right? We may not be able to go and check specific evidence, uh, listen to specific teachings, but we can look at what we have and we can decide just using this thing in between our ears called our brain, we can decide, is it rational that these things that Paul is being accused of could be true? Well, let's see, Paul's being accused of profaning Jewish beliefs and practices and of telling people not to go to the temple. All right, so that's kind of the first accusation. But they can find Paul because he's here in the temple undergoing a Jewish purity ritual and he is publicly supporting, including paying for, for others to complete a devout Jewish long-term lifestyle vow as laid out in the law of Moses. So Paul is only here to be accused because he is deeply involved in doing things that he could not or would not do if any of the accusations against him were true. Oh, see, when you take a few minutes and think about some of these things, a lot of times the problem disappears. Uh, the challenge here is that these folks aren't going to think about this. It's an emotional charge. And with the rumors and the stories, they may very well just believe. We'll find out here, though. Uh, what, what about the second charge? All right. The, the second charge is bringing a Greek into the temple thing. What's going on there? Well, the Jewish temple is divided up into several different zones. Think of it kind of like one of those Russian nesting dolls. There's a, a box around a box around a box around a box and so on, right? Now, the outside box, in this case, the, of the temple, it was called the Court of the Gentiles. Everyone was allowed in the Court of the Gentiles. This was a place that non-Jews could come to meet God. And for God-fearers, um, non-Jews who hadn't finished converting to Judaism, but who were working on it, this was a place that they could come and participate in the parts of worship that they were allowed to do. But in between the court of the Gentiles and the next court nestled inside of it, there was a wall. It was four and a half feet high. It had gated entrances and signs posted all along it that warned non-Jews that if they were to enter into the next court, Entry into that next court by anyone other than Jews was punishable by immediate death. Now, that court, that's called the Court of the Women, is uh, the, the name that was given to it. Um, and then inside of that court, the box inside of that box, uh, that was the Court of Israel, which was sometimes called the Court of Men. And then inside that box was another box, the court of priests. And finally, inside that box was the Holy of Holy. And each of these had a more and more restricted group who was allowed into it. But Gentiles, non-Jews, that would include the, the uh, Greeks that Paul was associating with, um, or, or non-Greeks that he was associating with who happened not to be Jews. Any of these non-Jewish people, any of these Gentiles, they had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. They could not cross over, right? Now, the temple guards, they were stationed throughout the complex. And one of the main reasons they were there was to ensure that no outsider could ever penetrate and so defile those inner courts. And in fact, Luke tells us the accusation of Paul bringing a Greek with him into the temple was based on nothing more than the fact that these guys had been together outside the temple in the city proper. If Paul had brought a Gentile into the women's court, his life would be forfeit along with that of his, his guest, right? Because he would be helping break that, that religious law of crossing that boundary. 
So we know, we know that both of these charges are false. But to this crowd being whipped up into this frenzied bloodlust by this handful of people from Ephesus who are making these accusations against Paul, they're hearing this as if something has just happened. And like most mobs, they react to what they are hearing rather than stopping and saying, is this rational? Which brings us to Acts 21 verse 30. The whole city was aroused. People came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. Well, they were trying to kill him. <laughs> don't, don't skim over that, right? Well, they were trying to kill him. News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So the whole city that being aroused, that sounds like hyperbole. And, and it is. It's, obviously, it's not everyone. There's people in outer Jerusalem or just outside the city who are going to have no idea what's going on inside the temple. But it very well may have seemed like the whole city uh, because the temple was often crowded and the area around the temple was often crowded and any uproar in the temple would get people to rush in to see what's going on. <laughs> you ever uh, been like driving by an accident and everyone stops and looks, slows the whole traffic thing down so that we can all take a look and see, oh, what happened there? Is there anyone dead? What's going on? Well, it's kind of the same thing back then. You know, when there's no TV, what do we do? We watch the world around us, right? So Josephus, who is a, a Jewish historian who wrote extensively about events during this period in history, he recorded several similar mobs rising up in response to uh, perceived slights against Jewish customs. And he described each of them using the same kind of language that Luke is using here. And as you are probably aware, offending someone's religious feeling is kind of like firing a Roman candle into a room full of gasoline fumes. It has the potential to be explosive. Now, in this instance, as this cry goes up and people begin to rush in, Paul is seized and he's dragged out of the court of the Gentiles. I'm sorry, out into the court of the Gentiles. Um, so he's pulled out of the temple proper, out of those inner courts, out to the court of the Gentiles. So from the restricted places to the place where everyone's allowed. And every gate that allowed access to the inner courts was then closed and locked to prevent any entry. This was part of the job the temple guard was trained for. They acted quickly to prevent any chance of human blood being spilled inside the holy places. Now make no mistake here, human blood was about to be spilled, right? Not, they just, they didn't want it to happen inside the temple's courts. They wanted to make sure that you got out into the outer court, that court of the Gentile, not in the, the holy set aside area. Custom said that any uh, uh, trespass or profanity happening inside the temple would make that temple profaned until that trespasser, that interloper, was executed. Philo, who was a popular Jewish philosopher and writer in those days, he declared that there was no appeal for non-Jews entering the temple's inner courts. They would be killed, right? As Paul was being pulled out and the gates were being sealed, word of this impending riot reached the Roman military commander in Jerusalem. Now you're probably thinking, how on earth would that word get to him so fast? Well, let me tell you, it got to him so fast because the Antonia Fortress, home to the cohort of soldiers responsible for keeping peace in the city, was actually attached to the temple. There are two staircases that emptied from the tower fortress into the outer temple court. So the station was there to prevent uprisings. This was the area that they had decided was the best area to be in to stop any uprising before it got started. Right? In a room full of fumes, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, were here attached to this temple, attached to that court of the Gentiles as like a, a fire suppression system waiting to be activated right? So, and by the way, 
don't think that Claudius Lysias, that was the commander's name, don't think Claudius was there to save Paul. His job was to maintain order. That's what he and his men were there to do. That's what they trained to do. That's what they looked for. Anything disordered that might cause them to need to appear quickly, which is what they did. There's an uproar. Soldiers watching over the court immediately notified their commander. The commander sticks his head out, sees that there's some kind of commotion going on around this one guy, and they immediately get soldiers out there. And when the soldiers come down, the crowd stopped their assault on Paul as they appeared. Uh, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was well known for the way it was applied rather indiscriminately against those who seemed to be a threat. The, the peace of Rome involved killing anyone who was disturbing the peace of Rome. Now, the crowd may have thought that they had the right to beat Paul to death, and legally they did, but if the soldiers disagreed, well, I'm sorry, I should rephrase that, uh, legally, if they had been correct in their charges, they had the right to beat Paul to death. But if the soldiers disagreed with that, um, the, the soldiers could just start killing people until the disturbance ended and then sort it out later. And that would work out fine for them. Later, we'll see that uh, uh, Claudius Lysias was concerned that Paul was trying to start an uprising, not because he knew who Paul was, but because he thought Paul might be somebody else, which is why he puts an end to the crowd's assault by making an arrest. Verse 33. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. And notice the arrest comes before any kind of, yeah. <clears throat> Some people say police tactics haven't changed in 2000 years. Some in the crowd shouted one thing, some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. I see, this is a good, good guy. He's actually, he's doing the right thing to quell this without further difficulty, without further bloodshed. Verse 35, when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Now, um, every piece of this happened fast. The accusers, they whipped up the crowd, right? The crowd dragged Paul out. The temple guards followed their first priority and sealed the inner courts, while the crowd began its assault on Paul. The Romans showed up before the temple guards could turn their attention to quelling the riot. The crowd, fearing the soldiers, stopped what they were doing. Paul gets handed over to the Romans. Their commander has the apostle chained up, one hand manacled to one soldier, the other locked to another soldier. And only then does the commander say, well, what's going on? And when he couldn't get a straight answer because so many people were yelling so many different things, he just arrested Paul at that point. Now, what just happened? What just happened? Look back a few verses. Acts chapter 21 still, but look back to verses 10 and 11. Luke writes, after we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to, his, coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. What just happened? The Jewish leaders have just handed Paul over, bound up to the Gentiles, as the Holy Spirit through Agabus had said they would do, right? So, uh, uh, point of uh, kind of logistics to help you keep some stuff straight here. If Paul had been arrested by the temple guard, he would have been left to be tried by the Sanhedrin instead of being taken into Roman custody. But now, if the temple guard or their leadership wanted him... If they wanted Paul, they would have to get him extradited from the Romans because he has been officially arrested. Paul, knowing how being in Sanhedrin custody, the Sanhedrin's the Jewish ruling council who is in charge of the temple guard. Paul knows how being in Sanhedrin custody had worked out for Jesus. He's going to fight against any chance that he's going to be given over to those guys. That comes later, though. What's happening right now, he's being led away. The crowd is still so keyed up about Paul, they keep pushing and jostling. They're trying to get at him so much so that the soldiers end up carrying him out and up the stairs into the fortress. Or, or perhaps I should say that they started to 
And the whole time the crowd was shouting, chanting, raving after Paul, get rid of him, which is a, a terrible translation. Uh, a more direct English version would be away with him, away with him, away. But even that's not quite right because they're not saying away as in please remove him from this area. They're saying away as in do away with him, kill him, kill him, kill him. Paul's intended effort to show that he still supported the traditional values for his people is a huge failure. He is now barred from the very center of Judaism. He will never be allowed inside the temple again. It's possible to read this whole event as, as a final refusal of the good news by the Jewish people, uh, although that's probably a little over the top. Do you know what we really see here? The thing that we see most of all that is often skipped by uh, people who are preaching on this section, we see that we should listen to God. When the Holy Spirit said to Paul through many other believers that going to Jerusalem was going to end up with him in chains, he should have listened. Instead, he showed up and he created this headache for the believers in Jerusalem. He put time and effort into doing a thing to try to make himself look good to people. And he's almost been killed for it. And now he's in the hands of the Romans. I know that this is more or less what Paul expected to happen. Probably not at this time in this place or in this way, but this is more or less what he expected to happen. So he's probably not disappointed by the whole thing. In fact, we're going to see he's going to try to use it to, uh, to preach, even from this platform of being carried up the stairs. But we'll get to that another time. I'd like to just point out who we haven't heard from in this little episode so far. You know, who we haven't heard from, we haven't heard from God. Now, I'm not saying God wasn't there. Obviously, he was. But there are no further miraculous interventions, no heavenly nods of approval, no miracles, no encouragements. Paul made the decision to go. The Spirit sent him many messengers in multiple places to tell him not to go or he'd end up in chains. Paul accepted that and he did it anyway. He was sure that he wanted to be locked up. And, and now he is. Can God still use him? Well, of course, God can work in each of us, even in the most complicated situations we get ourselves into. But that doesn't mean there might not have been a better time, place, or way for Paul to be used. I keep coming back to the fact that every message brought to him came as a warning, not as an encouragement, but he took every one of them as an encouragement. But I suppose God does work in mysterious ways. Maybe this was how Paul got encouraged was by people telling him not to do things. I, some of us are like that. We're going to stop here for today. Paul is not done being arrested, but we'll see how that goes next time. For today, I want you to remember, I want me to remember, to pay attention to what God is saying to us. As long as we go with God, we have nothing to fear. Not here, not now, not anytime, not anywhere. Right? Well, that's a good thing to remember, isn't it? Whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you think you've got yourself to, you have nothing to fear because God is already there. Go with God. Go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you this week. Catch you next time.